parliament is being held at a time when the whole world one month ago was celebrating what it called the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 70 years of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was drafted from 1946 to 1948 over a series of 82 meetings which brought together these 30 articles which actually also form the basis of our own constitution, foundation of our own constitution which we drew also from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And this Declaration of Human Rights starts with the words, all human beings are born free. All human beings are born free. And this word is important. It never said all men are born free. It said all human beings are born free. And that is attributed to an Indian participant in the entire drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights who said, it cannot be all men are free. And the whole question of gender contribution to the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights came from India, with this lady insisting that it had to be all human beings are born free. And the whole concept of equality rose within the UDHR from that fight. If the UDHR continued at the global level, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a document that puts together a variety of rights. And when we talk about human rights, the general concept is this, this khaki clad policeman on the road. That's the only concept of human rights that we have. Human rights means a policeman beating you, a policeman torturing you, or something to do with the policeman. And today I want to take you into a process where we understand for whom, but before for whom, what is this human rights? In fact, it should have been made compulsory in your university that while you come out of your law, while you come out of your management, while you come out of your engineering, while you come out of your graduation or post graduation, you also come out with a compulsory program of the constitution of this country. So that is what is most important for us. Everything else will follow. But if you don't know the constitution, if you don't know the fundamental rights, you cannot survive on the street. You cannot survive as a wife. You cannot survive as a husband. You cannot survive as a, as a woman in the society. And that is what is essential. But we don't have that. In our country, human rights has been codified in what is known as the Protection of Human Rights Act in 1993. And there are four rights that are specifically mentioned. And these are our right to life, our right to equality, our right to liberty, and our right to individual dignity. But left at that, it doesn't mean anything. That right to life includes your right to food. That right to life includes your right to water. That right for a large number of women here includes your right to life, which means right to live without any form of violence as a girl child in this country, as a young woman in this country, as a widow in this country, as a wife in this country, as a mother in this country, to live without any form of violence. To live and work in a college like this as a lady professor without any form of sexual harassment. That is the right to life of a woman. The right to life also includes the right to food, the right to housing, the right to a good environment, air, the right to livelihood. And you can go on on all these rights. To right to a free trial, legal aid in court, speedy trial in court, the right to travel abroad. You can go on and on and on. And all in your minds will be wondering if this is what is right to life. How is it that I see on the pavements of my city a number of people who go homeless, a number of people who go without three meals a day, a number of people who don't have clean drinking water in their houses, a number of people who don't have any health care, number of people who are not able to access our own government schools that we have in our places. What is this disparity that we see? That is the effectuality of this right to life put into practice. It was nice to hear about this government and that government. I don't belong to any governments. I am attacked by the earlier government, I am attacked by the present government. People in government will always attack those who work for human rights because we raise those questions which are very important. When I was invited to your college, the first name that came to me about Nagpur was Professor Sai Baba, who is living in the Nagpur Central Jail. A professor who has been convicted of an offence. 
I am not bothered about his conviction. His conviction can be fought by lawyers in courts. And he might be convicted, he might be released. But he is a 90% disability professor. A professor who is 90% disabled, who cannot stand on his own, who cannot access the toilets in the jail. The jail in Nagpur does not have anything friendly for persons with disabilities. He is 90% disabled, disabled. We have all the conventions for persons with disabilities. We have the law for persons with disabilities. We have all the concerns that every government speaks of. But Professor Chai Baba is dying every day. The Professor of English is dying every day in your city. In your city. And you are sitting here talking about human rights. The National Human Rights Institution is insensitive to the day-to-day -day killing of Sai Baba in this jail in, 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 in Nagpur today. And therefore, it is important that we look at this right to life in relation to the number of ordinary people of our country who are, whose, wife, whose, whose rights are being violated on a day-to-day -day basis because of certain policies that the government takes. The government policies that were mentioned earlier about displacement, yes, development needs will call for displacement, but that displacement should be after the person who is displaced has been rehabilitated. The second part of the sentence was missed by the speaker who spoke before. So we are all for human rights, we are all for development, but we want to ensure that human rights and development march together and you don't have only a development where the rights of people is thrown to the winds. I think it is important for us to understand what this right equality is, which is, which is, which is heard very well, but our right equality is the most powerful right equality we have globally, because we have undertaken the task of trying to equalize, attempting to equalize in this country, a society which was totally unequal. So, a society which was totally unequal because of the patriarchy which continues today. Because of the male chauvinism that continues today. And women, 50% of our population, continue to be unequal. Because of the system of caste, we have remained a completely, a completely casteist society where caste discrimination and practices of untouchability continue till today. Till today. You are at a prestigious institution and therefore maybe coming from families where your parents are privileged not to be talking to you about your caste and we are happy that is, the, that is the truth. But you move out of your families, move into the villages, move into the rural India, move into the slums in the this, in this, in this city or other cities and you will see how caste works. And if you, if you go on, the higher you go, the more sophisticated the caste works. We are in a very, very unequal society. To set that unequal, socially unequal society into order was what we brought this positive discrimination understanding of our right to equality. And this is not being taught. And since it is not being taught to all of us, we are forgetting that we come from an India with thousand years of baggage of inequality around us. And for those thousand years of inequality that we are carrying, it takes a lot of time for us to be able to overcome that and move on to equal, equal equality opportunities in our, in our life. Liberty is the, is the other aspect of human rights that has been defined. And that liberty includes the right to associate, the right to move freely. But that is, I, I don't think anybody in that world or anybody anywhere in the country today can have a peaceful protest without seeking the permission of the police. You don't have that. I recently am engaged in the killing of 16 people. The blatant national lie is calling me 13 people. 16 people in a, in a, in a city called Tutukure. Tutukure, as we say it in Tamil, the port of Tutukure, where for establishing, countering the establishment of a corporate copper smelting plant called Sterling, run by the Vedanta group. The people of the city, in lakhs, in lakhs and lakhs, moved on to a peaceful protest. But on the last day, on the 22nd of May, they were brutally attacked by the police, leaving a series of deaths that took place totally to 16 people who died. Now in that place, normalcy is, is what is prevalent, is what has been told to the country. And the normalcy is that if anybody dares, anybody dares, speak out in public, if anybody belongs to a WhatsApp group, if anybody belongs to a WhatsApp group, a group which is an anti slavery people's movement WhatsApp group, he or she is summoned to the police station and ensure that you get out of that group. And all this is done without using law, without summoning people with summons, 
uh, as, as is expected to be done under law. So a variety of means by which you find this whole right to liberty is also being taken away. It is very nice for organized political parties to have their forms of protest and gathering and conferences for which permissions are given. But for the poor of this country, who wish to draw the attraction of the government to the issues that they face in their villages, in their panchayats, in their talukas, in their districts, etc., they are never, ever given. And it is gradually, by denying our right to liberty, I, I, I say it with great responsibility, it is by denying our right to liberty that we are moving people into forms of, of, of protest which are violent in nature, which many of us are not supporting. If people today are taking up to a variety of methods which are not peaceful, it is because this state is denying people the right to liberty, the right to peaceful protest, the right to peacefully assemble, etc. And basically, the personal dignity is the fourth element. So all this put together is what our, our Protection of Human Rights Act is human rights in this country. And if you take that as a standard, my dear friends, unfortunately, the truth is that human rights is violated every day everywhere, in every form, and it is not in the police stations of this country. If you want to compare, you will find that in, in our health, in our education, I ask you, how many of you are educated out of government schools in this college? Those who came out of government schools, please put up your hand. Who studied in government schools, please turn around and see how many people have put up their hands. I have this light in front of me, but I'm trying to, trying to be very fair. I think I can see about 20, 25 hands which are, which are up. If I, if I, if I, if everybody got me right. Today, the hierarchical society is in our schools. And what equality is this? How can it be equal that somebody is taught, he starts his or her life in an unknown body, where there is no teaching that takes place, where there is perhaps in many places in our country there is not even a seat. And then there are some in our country who will be able to start their lives in a, in a completely different pre-KG type of Montessori training school. This is the inequality in the system. I was three years ago, friends, you'll have to, you'll have to believe these stories. Three years I was addressing a meeting in Bhutan and suffered a heart attack. And I, I, I realized I was, I, was, I was going through that process and I had a medical friend next to me. And he said, you have to rush yourself to a hospital here. And the moment I said, when he said hospital, I think that was the time when the, the minor attack would have taken place because hospitals give you attacks rather than save you from attacks. So I was looking for my credit card and I did not have it on me. And I was feeling very embarrassed. And he said, what are you looking for? So I said, no, I'm looking for something because you said I have to rush to a hospital. He said, my dear friend Henry, Bhutan doesn't have private practice. Bhutan doesn't have private hospitals. All hospitals are state managed at state cost. So you are going to get free treatment and the best quality treatment which every citizen of this country gets. And I can tell you, my dear friend, I can tell you, my dear friend, they saved my life, that's a different question than any doctor would have done. But during those three days I was there in the hospital, when they did the thrombosis and saved my life, what I learned was that this right to equality in health and state health at no, no private hospital was possible. Was possible. I can bet our Apollo hospitals or whatever Fortis hospitals or whatever hospitals you want can compete with the Bhutan hospital you will find that they stand much better in terms of their overall performance and cleanliness and medical standards that they maintain there. So it is possible. It is possible that our government schools can, can, can achieve greater heights than our private schools. It is possible that our government hospitals can save life much better than our, our private hospitals can do. And I think it is a belief in this that is what is most important. Friends, if this is what human rights is, then it is very clear the question that was asked, who should be protected? Everyone has to be protected. Human rights is for you. Human rights is for sir. Human rights is for Professor Shantikumar. Human rights is for, for the ordinary Kamath or, or, or Kumar 
or Kamachi, who's on the streets of Nagpur, human rights is the same for all of us together. Human rights is for everyone. Human rights is not for the same for the same for the And if you put all of us, then you will see human rights is for the poorest of the poor, the marginalized of the society, the excluded of the society, human rights is precisely for them. Friends, if that is what human rights is, where do we look at for this human rights? Of course, the courts of law is what we always say. But this country has a unique institution, which we have to be proud of, which no other country in this globe has. There are many things which we are not proud of our country. But as a genuine activist, I would like to say that this is the only country globally where we have 169 institutions designated to protect human rights. You have the National Human Rights Commission. You have the National Commission for Women. You have the National Commission for Minorities. You have the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights. You have the National Commission uh, um, on Scheduled Caste. You have the National Commission for Scheduled Rights. You have the Central Information Commission, which is, which is, which is much to do with, with human rights. You have the National Commission for Persons with Disabilities. And you have the National Commission on Safari Rights. And all these institutions are continued in any state. Your state, Maharashtra, has all these institutions at the state level. And if you put them together, there are about 169. Unfortunately, many of our own judges or many of the presidents and chairpersons of these commissions do not understand that there are so many institutions in our country precisely to protect human rights. Unfortunately, we have politicized all those institutions. Today, if you want the National Human Rights Commission, if you want a woman member in the Human Rights Commission, you have to belong to one side of the polity. And I don't want to say which side of the polity, you know well which side of the polity she will have to be. And the government is very proud to say we have got a woman member of the NHRC, but the woman member of the NHRC was a hardcore RSS member that everybody knows. So this is the leanings, and I say this happens everywhere. Friends, I have been under attack, and I think an audience like this needs to know. Working for human rights, we are all called human rights defenders in this country. Professor Sai Baba is a human rights defender. Another professor who is also in Maharashtra in jail, in Pune, is Professor uh, 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 Sudha Bharadwaj, a professor of law, teaching law at the National University in Delhi, a very strong state humanist, a person who could have made a completely different life in the US, sacrificed all that because she wanted to work in this country. She is now counting the bars in the, in the, in the Pune uh, uh, jail. Now, all these are human rights defenders. And when you do human rights, you have to be willing to pay a price. And, and the learned speaker who spoke before me, the, 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 the most uh, respectful spokesperson of the, of the ruling party, spoke about human rights activists. There are human rights activists and activists. And I want to tell you that we are all people who pay. I come from an organization whose registration to receive funds was suspended by none other than the famous former finance minister of this country the co-minister of this country, senior advocate, Mr. P. Chidambaram. I'm mentioning his name because that was not by the BJP, that was by the Congress. So those of you who think I'm, I'm trying to attack a government, it is not a particular government that we are attacking, but the state and its stance on human rights. Why? Because we raise questions about the standards of the National Human Rights Commission of India, which is our institution. It is for your protection and my protection. When your, right, when your rights are violated and my rights are violated, it is the National Human Rights Commission which is able to restore it. And the National Human Rights Commission's performance has been sliding and we had to raise the question. And we raised it internationally in terms of its accreditation. I had to be taught a lesson. Because of our UN interventions, we were told that our right to function as a human rights organization and receive resources would be withdrawn. And it is 1,500 days, my dear friends that the bank account has been closed. But we will say, we are continuing our fight to protect human rights. Your bank accounts can be closed, we can be arrested, you can charge us with any amount of charges, you can call us whatever you want, including calling us urban access, but we will continue to uphold the constitution of this country because we believe in the constitution of this country. We believe in the right, right to life, equality, liberty, and individual uh, dignity that the constitution proposes to us and proposes to protect and it is our job as human rights defenders to ensure that we will act. And though it is not enough to also only speak about human rights, it is important for you to act. I call upon all of you, I call upon this institution as I complete.
that if you do not are having a session of the sort in the student parliament, if you do not have a course on human rights, you are you are not honest to the fees you receive from your students. Please provide them a basic course. They can, they, can, they can decide what they do with that course later. But once a girl in this audience tomorrow has a domestic violence and she has to go to the police station, it is on that day that she will remember her human rights class. The day a young man in this audience has to face a wrong ring with the police and is drawn into the police station, it is on that day that he will think about the human rights that was taught to him or her in the class. Don't give them theoretical human rights classes, give them practical human rights classes. How many women here in this audience who are professors have faced domestic violence? And not one of you will put your hands up. And I can tell you, 50% of you would have faced. But never had the courage. Never had the courage. Never were taught which group of women you should go take recourse to on, on occasions of this sort. I hope this National Student Parliament will lay the foundation for the introduction of a course on human rights in your campus. But friends, only courses on human rights don't make you an activist. It is everyday action, my dear friends. And those actions can be on a small little instrument that you hold in your hands. Every day you read the newspaper, a variety of violations you read on the newspaper, don't be silent. Act. Forward complaints to all these national human rights institutions. All of you have Android phones, and we do a variety of things on our phones. Rarely, rarely do we prefer complaints on behalf of a number of people in this country who don't have anybody to prefer complaints on their behalf. I appeal to you, let this not be a lecture. Let this be a resolution that we all pass together, that we will not remain silent, we will take human rights into our hands, we will get engaged, and it is by getting engaged that our charity in human rights, our belief in human rights, and our value for human rights will grow. Thank you. Don't be silent, speak up, act, be aware, be engaged. The next speaker is Professor Dr. Sanjeevi Shantra Kumar, the Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor of Law and Dean, School of Law, GD Goyal University, Gurgaon. Interestingly, the title comes with a question, who should be protected? 